Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Laura. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here today. Um, on the 5th of April, 1603, James VI embarked upon an exhibition uniting England and Scotland under a dual monarchy. He had ambitious plans for his unified realm and viewed the journey from Edinburgh to London as symbolic of a new reign, a new English royal house, and most importantly, a politically united archipelago. This was to be the first of 23 expeditions known as progresses that James would undertake over the next 22 years. The Royal Progress was a well-established political institution utilized by both Tudor and Stuart monarchs throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. In the summer months, the court would vacate the palace complex for a tour of the surrounding counties that sometime traveled much further afield. As Keeley mentioned, progresses were lavish affairs upon which the daily expenses of the court could be transferred to the provincial elites obliged to host it. They also had significant political value in affording the monarch the chance to see and be seen, requiring crucial support and reinforcing their authority en route. For James, the progress became a primary tool of provincial governance. He employed them far more extensively and effectively than traditional historiography gives him credit for. In this, they are distinct from the notoriously frequent hunting holidays he undertook for pleasure. During the 400 mile inaugural progress, James was seen and importantly judged by his new subjects on roads and noble estates and in towns, villages and inns. Situating him in these backdrops, far removed from the royally managed palace environment, is critical to a fellow understanding of both a man and a monarch. This paper will highlight the triumphs and missteps of James's first journey through the English countryside, as he marked it, quote, like some wolf or tiger spreading his scent through his territory. It will examine the organization of the progress, James's demeanor, and the political devices he utilized throughout, as well as the reception of his English subjects towards their new king. It will argue that along the journey, the self self, first self-proclaimed king of Great Britain, not only adapted to a Tudor style of visible monarchy, but established a new, distinctly Stuart royal identity that would later come to define his English reign. Organization of the progress began immediately after Elizabeth's death. As progresses always had been and would continue to be, it was expensive and disrupted for all, disruptive for all concerned. The Privy Council and Lord Chamberlain's offices in both Scotland and England became hives of activity. Itineraries known as geese were prepared Harbingers were dispatched to inspect potential stopovers, and post routes were primed for a demanding six weeks. Simultaneously, private hosts hurriedly stocked and prepared their homes to create a welcome fit for a king. The cost of hosting a monarch could be astronomical. For example, when James's court visited Farnham Castle a few years later, his host, the Bishop of Winchester, spent a thousand pounds, or approximately 140,000 pounds today, on just three days of royal entertainment. Prepare for ceremonial civic entries, town authorities, corporations, and trade guilds work together to beautify the town and create an enduring memorial of the visit. The coat of arms of Charles I uh, at King's Manor, shown here, is a fantastic example of how buildings are embellished with civic royal entries. In 1603, citizens of York were ordered to paint the outside of their houses and remove all clogs, stones, heaps, trees, dung hills, and filth out of the streets. Unfortunately, this filth also alluded to vagrants and beggars whose, quote, riot and filthy and beastly lechery and whoredom sullied the city streets. Although the progress of 1603 was much larger in geographic scale than most, these activities, their costs, and the order in which they occurred remain largely unchanged throughout James's reign. They also follow a prototype engendered by earlier Scottish and English monarchs. Thus, the logistics and mechanics of the progress were not fundamentally altered by the accession of a Stuart king. James was determined to take full advantage of the propaganda opportunities the progress afforded. To project a distinctly Tudor aura of majesty, one of his first acts of King of England was ordering the Privy Council to send jewels and other furniture which did appertain to the late queen. This included coaches, horses, litters, and whatsoever his Privy Council did think meet to accompany him on the journey south. 
the image on the left is a royal coach which was presented by James's ambassador to the Tsar of Russia in 1604, um, and it gives a good indication of how monarchs travelled during this period. Upon reaching English soil at Berwick on the 6th of April, James heard a sermon, a sermon by B Bishop Toby Matthew before surveying the fortifications of the town, firing a, Karen, a cannon, and commending the soldiers. In a symbolic interpretation worthy of Elizabeth herself, James then pronounced the sudden rainstorm to be a good omen, saying, the sun before the rain represented his happy departure, the downpour to be the grief of Scotland, and the succeeding fair weather, the joy of England at his approach. The martial enthusiasm he exuded at Berwick is certainly at odds with James's later reputation as Rex Pacificus, while his somewhat florid language contrasts with the traditional portrait of an overly formal pedagogue who was, quote, always undignified in public. But these specific actions were designed to introduce a distinctly Stuart monarch. They fashioned the image of a virtuous king who is revered by his Scottish subjects, a pious king for whom Protestant considerations were fundamental, and a king who could easily align himself with martial masculinity in a way that his female predecessor could not as easily do. Exercising these traditional values of good kingship from the outset revealed James's understanding that many of his new subjects were desirous of change. Not having stepped foot in England before, to James, it must have seemed a profusion of wealth far beyond that of, quote, barren, penurious Scotland. Upon reaching York on the 16th of April, the abundance was quite literally flowing into the streets. A conduit running white and claret wine allowed every man to drink as much as he listed. Although many historians have attested that James blithely rushed to take possession of his lucrative inheritance, the six-week progress, in fact, proceeded at a leisurely rate. He even eagerly applied himself to the affairs of his new realm on route. Ample correspondence between the king and council in London survives, revealing his input on subjects such as the treatment of recusants, support of the United Provinces, and arrangements regarding Elizabeth's funeral. Perhaps elated that the years of uncertainty over his succession were over, James was charming and charismatic throughout. Um, this is the only image I could find where he looks even remotely um, happy. Um, these are attributes rarely ascribed to him by history. In York, for example, he declined the offer of a coach, declaring that the people are desirous to see a king, and so they shall. They shall see both his body and face. In Doncaster, lack of suitable accommodation forced him to lodge at the Sun and Bear Inn. Upon his departure, he presented the innkeeper with the lease of a manor house of good value and gratitude for his good entertainment. Moreover, in Newcastle, he simultaneously demonstrated his mercy and devout Protestantism by ordering the release of all prisoners, excepting murderers, traitors, and of course, papists. Somewhat more ominously, however, the journey featured several public executions orchestrated by James himself. At Newark-upon-Trent, the king received word of a cut purse who had been stealing from the crowd gathering to watch the train pass. In a display of rash bravado, James ordered the immediate hanging of the, quote, base pilfering thief, an order which was swiftly executed. This may have been a simple understanding of English law, which compared to Scotland's was well established and deeply ingrained. Or perhaps it was the first occasion on which his new subjects bore witness to James's proclivity for absolutism and action. After all, relatively few would have been familiar with his treatise, The True Law of Free Monarchies. In response to the execution, his astonished new English councillors carefully, but quickly, advised that in England, if not in Scotland, the sovereign left such cases to the due process of law. The sheer size and magnificence of the 1603 progress train would have made a, consider a considerable impact on those who watched it pass. It's likely that few in the north of England had living memory of Henry VIII's 1541 progress, the last time a reigning English monarch had traveled as far north as York. The majority of those in rural areas were unlikely to have seen anything comparable before. A lack of surviving qualitative evidence makes it difficult to gauge the reception of the rural populace towards their new king. However, there appears to have been a sense of relief at the accession of the male monarch, already furnished with an air and a spare, some of whom are shown here. The brusque words of an honest plain Scotsman reveal the ostensible elation with which James was received. The Scotsman commented that, the applause of the people in so obsequious and submissive a manner will spoil a good king. 
James was, himself was later rather romantically to recall how his subjects had their eyes flaming nothing but sparkles of affection, their gestures discovering a passionate longing and earnestness, and earnestness to meet and embrace their new sovereign. Quantitative descriptions suggest that the number who ventured to catch a glimpse of James were incredible. As he drew nearer to London, the crowds increased daily, fighting each other for the best view and filling the countryside to such an extent that they, quote, covered the beauty of the fields. One eyewitness, John Savile, positioned himself in an upstairs chamber at the Bell Inn in Edmonton and attempted to tally the concourse. Within less than half an hour, he had counted 309 horses and 137 footmen, a throng which continued from four o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon without intermission. Consequently, the king was fain to publish an inhibition against the inordinate and daily access of people's coming, no doubt provoked by his fear of assassination following a turbulent formative career as King of Scotland. However, if the sheer number of people who turned out to welcome James was a barometer of public feeling towards him, the first progress of his English reign was an apogee of success. Accessibility and congeniality were vital to the success of the progress. These qualities manifested themselves through political devices, such as the granting of petitions, gift exchange, and the conferring of honors. Such strategies were mainstays in the political armory of James's Tudor predecessors, but on the 1603 progress, he employed them with gusto. For example, he was presented with a petition from the poor inhabitants of Hull that they might be protected from the daily spoils done to them by those of Dunkirk. The king, in a princely and heroic, heroic reply, assured them that no Dunkirker should after dare do any of his subjects wrong. Personally managing and determining the results of petitions became a hallmark of James's reign, helping to placate, placate and endear his people to him in times of political crisis. The progress is also an opportunity to, to secure ties of patronage and cultivate personal relationships with provincial elites. This could be exercised on the road with a publicity unobtainable from the confines of the palace. One very public approach was introducing a cycle of gifts exchange that James, was, that James was careful to nurture and keep intact for the remainder of his reign. Mutual gifting was recognized as a profound display of patronage, affinity and deference that was central to political identity. Roman philosopher Seneca wrote, to give a benefit is a sociable thing. It joineth that man's favor and obligeth this man's friendship. Or as 17th century politician Sir William Drake more cynically put it, by gifts and presents, a man attains his ends. A procedure was initiated upon James's arrival at the town or home of his host that illuminates the significance of space and intimacy on progress. In the guise of a gift, the town or house would be figuratively offered to the king and the keys ceremoniously handed over to him. This was a process in which the royal visitors became both guests and hosts, while the hosts became almost guests in their own home. This public ceremony symbolized a bond of allegiance between sovereign and host, while simultaneously reinforcing the latter's position within the local hierarchy. More tangible gifts from those eager to court favor with the new king were also plentiful. Civic donors tended to limit themselves to profuse amounts of gold. Newark contributed a fair gilt cup, Newcastle gave James a purse full of gold, and York proffered a cup full of gold, itself filled with gold. This is an example created to commemorate the coronation of James II later in the 17th century. The coins were quickly deposited into the privy purse, but the cups often ended up in the hands of footmen as perquisites, an insensitive custom which no doubt exasperated the donors. Private hosts, however, could be somewhat more imaginative with their gifts. So Oliver Cromwell had clearly been told of the new king's fondness for the hunt and offered horses, hounds, and diverse hawks of excellent wing. So Edward Denny took a similar approach, bequeathing a gallant horse, a rich saddle, and furniture corresponding to the same. When James's consort Anna of Denmark made her own separate inaugural progress south shortly after James, so Robert Spencer's entertainment at Althorpe was little more than a device concocted to frame the giving of a gift. A considerable jewel, presented modestly as a simple gift, was offered to Anna by an actor playing the Fairy Queen. Although the actor explicitly denied any hope of our glory by the deed on behalf of his patron, the implication was clear. Obligations have been established, 
and Spencer was summarily created a baron less than a month later. Evidently, hosts expected to receive something far more valuable in return for their material outlay. And when it came to conferring honors, James frequently acquiesced. On the southbound journey alone, he created 237 new knights, causing Gilbert Dugtail to observe that the king dealt honors as freely to our nation as their hearts would wish. This was in stark contrast to Elizabeth, who was so cautious in her creation of knights that it was said by her death, hardly a shire in England could muster enough knights to make a jury. In politicizing gifts and granting petitions, James was continuing early traditions of exchanging favor for allegiance. However, by employing a political device somewhat underutilized by Elizabeth, the conferring and later selling of Chilvan Reconners, James has set out his stall as a different style of monarch. Graffiti, spotted at Cheapside in 1603, remarked, this world's a stage where on today, kings and mean men parts do play. This ephemeral observation neatly encapsulates how sovereignty was intrin intrinsically linked to performance. It also reveals contemporary understandings about the collaborative nature of early modern sovereignty, in which the image of the ruler was forged in and out of dialogue with their subjects. Tradition would have it that James was woefully inadequate in his attempts at both performance and collaboration. Conventional historiography also describes that nature had denied the power to appeal, denied James the power to appeal to the imagination of his subjects. However, as we have seen, on the inaugural progress in 1603, he performed the task of listening monarch with much the same aplomb as Elizabeth. As a foreign king and a largely unknown quantity in England, the progress, more than any other institution of government, provided James with the stage fundamental to the success of his dual monarchy. The path he chose once upon that stage incorporated elements of continuation and deviation. He adapted to an English style of visible monarchy, monarchy that ill-suited his experience and inclination, while simultaneously paving the way for a new Stuart royal image. The, the accession of a Scottish king had little effect on the mechanics and pageantry of the progress, but in his judicial arrogance and deployment of honors, we can see his Scottish heritage and personal idiosyncrasies influencing progress culture. This would become more marked in later progresses, particularly as he brought his vainglorious ideologies of union to the fore. In terms of audience reception, the six-week progress was arguably, arguably the most successful of his reign. In the years that followed, he found the process of interacting with his subjects increasingly tiresome. So too, many of his subjects had started to become tired of James. This sparked nostalgia for the golden age of Gloriana. However, despite strong opposition from his counselors and subjects, James pushed onwards, traveling persistently and extensively for the next 22 years. As David Ber Bergeron suggests, it was as if he could only make forward progress through constant motion. Thus, for James, progresses were not a diversion from the business of government, as is commonly claimed, but were the business of government. Thank you.